Hello, my name is Katherine Florence, and I'm a graduate from the Department of Art History, but my undergraduate was dual degrees in that and anthropology. I would like to start out by saying that I am an immigrant settler colonist, and that the grounds we are meeting upon is unceded Kanegahaga land. That being said, I am quite glad to be included in this conference. Today, I'm going to be talking about the moment I realized I could break down the ivory tower from inside. Go back with me four years. I'm an avid learner. I'm still that kid that goes into the library to pick up one book assigned for class and comes out with 15 about something completely different. University was basically paradise for me. For three years, I got up, did work, went to class, did more work, and slept. I was writing like tomorrow wasn't going to come. My parents didn't understand. They didn't have the books, the teachers, the ideas. They didn't even know where to start, and honestly, neither did I. Not for someone who wasn't an anthropologist like me. The metaphorical ivory tower is a disinterest with the current status outside its walls and the inability of the outside to get in. Anthropology is one discipline that has at least stuck its head out of the window, trying to reach out to the outside world. We've been listening, sure. It was still possible that all of our breakthroughs are still held back by that ivory wall, though. So I sat at my desk, trying to figure out how in this age of globalization, of collapsing time and space, how this was still an issue. And in that moment, I realized that the material of our canon is on its way to being less colonized. But access is not. As an anthropologist, that was frustrating. We pride ourselves on being a holistic discipline, reaching out into every facet of human existence, from biological evolution to the emerging effects of immigration, globalization, cosmopolitanism. The work we as students and anthropologists are doing is viscerally relevant to the current developments of our society. We're taught to make these bonds and to build up connections with the communities we work with. And yet, at the end of the day, we shuck off our muddy boots and pad back to our desks. We churn out papers that will never make it out of the university circuit. Never make it to the very people that made it possible. And I remember sitting there thinking, why? Why aren't these things accessible? This wasn't a question of ability. We have the resources, the audience, the need. So then it comes down to us and what we aren't doing. I'm going to present several options that we can practice every day to make our work available to those it should be reaching, including establishing unprofessional societies, which can more easily engage with public on more equal ground, networking and outreach using social media to encourage anthropological discussions, and the way students like you and me can make our work available outside of journals. Decolonizing asset access is partially a matter of getting the information out there. And to do that, we have to use unprofessional means. Now, when I say unprofessional, I do not mean act like an absolute walnut. Please don't. You still have to be well behaved. What I mean is that we need to stop approaching this through academia. We're tutored to get into journals to get recognition and only use peer-reviewed forums, present at conferences to meet others in the field, get known by other professionals. And while that's great for your career, it doesn't actually help the discipline. You end up talking about new things, but going in the same circles. We're producing only for ourselves. But here's the kicker. We already have what we need to break that cycle. The internet is perhaps our most powerful weapon in decolonizing our discipline. It ignited the Arab Spring. It's a major site of resistance in indigenous matters like no dabble. And the new Never Again movement taking place in the wake of gun violence in America. It can be our key out of the ivory tower. 
but only if we u- can use it to the fullest capacity as a network and platform for spreading information. Let's, let's start small. How many of you are on social media platforms? Just about everybody, huh? <laughs> Who's live tweeting this conference? Oh, one, one person. Sweet, bro, thanks. Well, I am. And why aren't you? Make a Tumblr, a Facebook page, a Twitter thread. Talk about what you're doing, what you're learning every day. For instance, this is a page I'm a part of, and I help run. It's the Canadian Latin American Archaeology Society. Currently, we're at 70 members strong from all over Canada and growing, reaching upwards of 300 people on a post. It's a continual dialogue, and that's one way of breaking down the tower. By starting a conversation, or joining a conversation. So let's get on to that dialogue, then. We're taught to write only for professionals like each other. Use the fancy words that sound good on paper, but no one understands that. Which is the same as trying to bake a cake using a calculus textbook written in Chinese. You can't apply something you don't understand. The first thing to change is who the audience is, then. We have to realize that we shouldn't just be writing for academics, but for real people, too. It won't get you into journals, but that's kind of the point. I wrote over 60 papers in my undergraduate. Only two ever made it into professional journal publication, one of which was published by my own university, which meant I had a bit of a helping hand getting there. What we write in our classes is not revolutionary by any measure. Most of it's review. But that doesn't mean it isn't interesting to read. Doesn't mean it isn't new to someone out there. You can make your own journal out of a blog site. Invite your classmates to contribute. Invite your online friends to contribute. It's not that hard. And here are a few examples of real people that have done just that. On to my last point. How many of you are members of the SAA, AAA, AIA, CAA, or any other anthropology or archaeology society? Yeah, me too. These are professional organizations, and their primary focus is on the card-carrying anthropologist. My neighbors aren't going to drop a hundred or so dollars to join. I can barely afford it. But we're told to do it anyways. That's where all the information is, tied up behind jargon and fees. Well, here's a story about how we can work around that. In 2017, I was given a chance to try something new. When I was arranging my immigration to Canada, I was told to keep in touch with the local research society in my area of focus, that being Mesoamerica. The one I found, the Canadian Society for Mesoamerican Studies, looked like it had died out in 2012. And I sent an email anyways, asking if it was still active. I got a response, and this went on for a few rounds. Last March, the last surviving board member shrugged and handed over control to me. At the time, a 22-year-old undergraduate he had only talked to through email. Some would call this insane. Those people included my parents, my professors, and anyone I've talked to. But I sat down at my desk and I thought back to the frustrations I've had with the SAA and the AAA. I didn't want to be like those. What if instead of a professional society that it had started out as, I made it into an unprofessional one? One where you don't have to be working towards a degree in archaeology to participate. All you need is an interest in the subject. Make it public. Make it present. Make it accessible. Give people a viable source of good information. You can join for nothing. Stay up to date on the most recent archaeological news in terms you can understand. You can ask questions and get answers. You can participate in discussions. Get resources. 
some would call this insane. I saw it as an opportunity. So I got to work. You may be thinking, okay, but how is this going to change the system if we're doing it unprofessionally? The thing is, decolonization isn't going to be easy. It's not comfortable. We have to put in effort. But as I've shown, you don't have to create a society like I did. We've played by the unspoken rulebook of academia. As students, we're told that what we learn in here, this ivory tower, will teach us how the system works out there in the greater world. When we run into broken paradigms, we're told to wait until we graduate, until we're in the field, until we get tenure. Wait, wait, wait. Wait until the discipline is ready to accept change. And when we do that, things don't change. We might not be able to bulldoze a tower, but we can speak up, tweet out, and post. And brick by brick, we can take it down. Thanks for listening.